Well, good afternoon. It's uh, Tuesday at two o'clock, and I'm here with uh, Larry Bash, and it's uh, glad you could be with us. You know, we, we started this, and we went on for the first hour or so, and I'm trying to get these so that it's a real discussion and a little bit shorter. And I'd like to encourage everybody to to write questions in as we do this. And I also like a shout out this Friday. Is it this Friday? This Friday at nine o'clock. On Merlin Yacht Racing on Facebook. Merlin Yacht Racing Friday at 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific. We're going to have a remote party. And so if you want to have a great time on a Friday night with a whole bunch of sailors and, and maybe learn a little bit about the, the sailboat that I've got, because people tend to always ask about it. Um, Larry's daughter, Lily, can hardly wait to get on the boat. It's kind of tied up, but we can hardly wait to go sailing again. It's been, I feel like it's been forever. And the only other thing I guess going on is my hair is getting longer, and it's it's hard to believe Larry's hair is actually getting longer too. But I, I told uh, Denise I said I might have to go ahead and drive all the way up to uh, Georgia you know, to go get a haircut sometime soon. So I know I'm not the only one that has these feelings right now, and a lot of us are just getting stir crazy. On the other hand, we're also getting a lot of work done at our law firm. I, the productivity has really just gone through the the roof except for the fact of getting around and actually on site field visits has been a little bit of a issue and obviously we can't have jury trials right now so besides that i think you know we've we've been managing pretty well over here at, at the firm zoom mediation zoom depositions moving the cases so you know i'm going to go through some of these things everybody kind of knows me tuesday chip that's the second one the third one there's my uh telephone number i've got my cell number i don't mind people uh, calling myself. I don't mind people texting me. I don't mind. Uh, and as a matter of fact, texting me is great. Uh, and there's Larry's as well, too. Except Larry, your cell number isn't there. Are you afraid on number? What slide is that? Number four. Why are you so afraid? Not afraid. Then why don't you tell everybody your cell phone number? Shoot me an email. No, come on. <laughs> See, I'm not afraid. People don't abuse it. So let's go to, to the next one. I think this, what is this? Slide five out of 31. Last week. So hold on a second. If you still do not know, the link will be posted for the PowerPoint presentation. So please open the PowerPoint presentation, follow along with us as we go through this, because there are some that have content with links. So anytime we talk about a blog, a research article, or anything like that, Chip, it's actually included in the PowerPoint presentation, but they can hyperlink it to the document. It, it, as a matter of fact, and, and Megan's over there, she's really practicing social distancing. She's probably 60 feet away from us right now. Megan, we go through and I wanted to have for all the live audience to be able to pull up all the handouts that we've got. And there's a lot of handouts this week. How does everybody get the handouts so they can download them? Is there is there a special thing they need to do on that? Yep, they'll just click the actual image. Just click the image. The PowerPoint and it opens up in another oh, window. Oh, and it opens up in another window and then they can save it or do whatever yep. they want to it. So good. So, so I've got those images, I got handouts for you. Um, make sure you keep them and you can read this afterwards. I'm going to try to keep this to 30 minutes today. We'll see. That probably not going to happen with him speaking, but we'll we're going to try to keep it down to a discussion of 30 minutes and we're trying to shorten these up. But, you know, if we go to the next slide, uh, what is this, 5 of 21? These are just the questions from last week. You know, we had some great questions. You know, what are the types of exposures for high-rise condos, you know, if, you, if your neighbor gets COVID? I don't know. But, you know, is it legal for the consumer's contractor to pay? All these others, you know, AAA and stuff like that. Of course, there was one about what are public adjusters going to do about that biased attorney, Steve Badger? Right. I don't know. What should they do about him, Larry? Steve, what should they do about you? You said you're going to have to watch this today. So I'm kind of curious what that answer would be. And uh, but at least the one thing about Steve Badger, unlike some other insurance defense attorneys that won't get on the same you know, pay Badger will show up and we'll duke it out and stuff like that. And people can cat call and whatever they do. He hangs right in there and makes an explanation for it. I think is is genuine from the insurance industry and what their viewpoint is. If you pay attention to it and um, well, I, like, but, I like Steve and his law firm because they also identify when their clients make mistakes sometimes. But the craziest thing, if you say you like somebody, somebody can say they're a biased appraiser or a biased umpire. Next thing you, you can't even point Steve Badger. But as your umpire or appraiser because you like him. Maybe he likes you as a colleague. I don't know. You really saying that in front of all these people, all your clients, that you like Steve Badger? I, I like Steve Badger. I like how he approaches where if it's not, he doesn't make up fraud claims like the current trend is. If he has an issue in a case, it's a, usually a real issue that needs to be addressed. 
now there's a trend. I think people are trying to take his business candidly are coming up with these fake defenses, which we can talk about another time when they're trying to allege things that aren't really real. But Well, I know about that. Yeah, That's when they take things out of context and stuff, but lawyers being lawyers. So let's go to slide number, what's the next slide? Six. Six. And this is a blog by an attorney in our firm. Well, Chip, what's the topic today? Oh, the topic's the last one. Uh, what is it, the last one? What are good practices during the act? No, no, no. The last one... Uh, Oh, can you talk on properly vetting umpires? And we'll actually change the rounds. The topic today is the selection and vetting of a good umpire. And so it's really important. I, I've said before, I think the selection of an umpire and an appraisal is probably the most important um, thing people can do, assuming you've selected a good, competent appraiser to work on your side, regardless if you're an insurance company um, or the policyholder, you know, whatever side it might be. The selection of that umpire is extraordinarily important um, and get one that's going to be fair and honest, uh, has integrity with everybody else in the process, um, is not going to be somebody who's just going to, we're going to talk about all this kind of stuff, just split the difference, be a lazy umpire, and instead be a, a you know a part of a three people on this uh, appraisal panel. But selecting that umpire, it's almost hard for me to think of something that's more important after maybe the selection of your first appraiser, but if you got a bad umpire, it doesn't even matter who your appraiser might be and you know, so, doing and, it. And there's no shortage of materials in this PowerPoint today, which we're not gonna go over all of them, but please follow along. Oh, I, there's a lot of literature out there on how to select a fair umpire. There's a lot of issues with an umpire. For example, um, is it more important to have a fair appraisal process because you have these umpires that um, continually work for these insurance companies? And obviously, as a policyholder advocate, we want to ensure a fair process versus the problem of having someone who may not have specific knowledge on the topic. And there's court cases that discuss you know, how you weigh those two issues. It's an issue that we deal with every time there's a petition to appoint an umpire. We're going to talk about what do you do when you cannot agree on an umpire. There's a crazy case out there where um, one party raced to the courthouse and didn't serve the petition to compel appraisal. Um, and then there, the actual court appointed an umpire on that list. And the question is, can someone just race to the courthouse and get an umpire appointed without telling the other side? So please stay with us um, and ask us the questions as we go along. But today's topic is all about umpires. So uh, we're going to go to the next, uh, actually the next slide. Well, the first one is the Insurance Appraisal and Umpire Association State of Appraisal. And that's a, it's on our blog. If you don't subscribe to our blog, just put Chip Merlin blog and you ought to subscribe to it. Every day you're going to get something about property insurance. Um, but Ryan Fowler wrote this, and there's a picture of Ryan. Ryan's out of our Houston office. He's a great trial attorney. He went to the uh, Jerry Spence trial uh, school as a graduate, you know, of that. And, um, and uh, as a matter of fact, I had Ryan was going to go try a case with me just before all this went down. And I think the other side got chicken after he showed up. They weren't so chicken of me, but he shows up. And next thing you know, we got, you know, a settlement that I guess is confidential. I can't discuss. So. Um, but Ryan wrote this, and it was actually taken from the context of what somebody else had written in a brief. And, and uh, it's, we all represent the insured ultimately. The insurance company and the policyholders advocates. We all should have the goal of making sure that the policyholder gets paid properly after disaster, you know, the damages to their property. And, you know, I, I think a lot of times we, we forget about that. It, it, um, and I have sometimes accused the insurance company of forgetting that, that that customer is every bit their customer after the loss happens is before when they were paying on the premium, you know? And, and so I, I would ask those, whether you're um, claims managers, adjusters, independent adjusters, appraisers on the other side, you know, this is important to the policy. Well, don't get me wrong, it's important to the insurance company as well too. And we were talking about, you know, something before, and this is, you know, a lot of times in the selection of an umpire, we're in a, even an appraiser, you know, we're looking for people's, you know, to be intimately, intimately concerned about what their positions are about the value of the claim, not 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 question? not who it is, you know, the and not. Question should be, what is owed on this claim, and how do we get there? And right. if the panel goes with that process. Every mediation I go to, there's a dispute, and we have to sit there with the insurance company. When I get a chance to talk to the adjuster or the corporate representative, my first question is, do you agree that we want to pay the insured what is owed? And I've never had an insurance company tell me from a starting place, no, that's not our intention. Well, I have. I have. I've had situations where there's just no way they could sit down there and 
we agree with you, Chip, blah, 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 but I can't agree with it because the insurance company is going to shoot me on it. What do you do then? You go to appraisal. What happens? They pick an umpire. Then, you know, their side of the appraisal then says inevitably, I can't agree with that, but I tell you what, I'm not going to fight you. Why don't you, the umpire, and you, the appraiser, agree? And we have these quick appraisal awards that are real big that should have been adjusted out to begin with, but somebody's afraid if they said this is the right number, they're going to get cut from being whatever it might be in the future. That goes on. I've had the opposite happen, I think, too, on the other side where I've had appraisers come back and says, what happened? I thought you were working hard on this. Well, how to have this horrible chip? Your client was just wrong. I went through this thing and the whole bit. You know, what can I say when somebody's giving an honest, you know, position with respect to what it is? Win, lose, or draw. I just want people to work hard and be honest about it and come to a right conclusion. I think that's what we're looking here. And I think that's what Ryan's quote was. If we go to the next slide, which is slide number eight, is it? Eight. Where it goes appraisers and umpires uh, and appraisals of valid, you know, appraisers, umpires, and appraisals of valid substitutions for the right to a jury trial depend upon viewpoint. You know, and I was talking somewhat about this, and on purpose, I put this quote underneath of it about insurance is a fantastic product. I believe insurance is a fantastic product. I think it's one we need more than ever today, and I want people to go buy it. Unfortunately, those who work for insurers are sometimes unfairly demonized simply because their work is not always consistent with the policyholder's interest. And then I honestly had to write this. I said, I am to blame for this at times. And so uh, I used to be an insurance defense attorney. I, I was for the first three years of what I was doing. I was on the insurance company side. And as I discussed in the book, Pay Up, and this new book about to come out, Merlin, I talk actually about the reasons why I left doing insurance defense work. I thought, especially in those days, there was nobody specializing in property insurance uh, law for policyholders. It was only on the insurance company side. And Paul Butler, Sandy Burnett, uh, John Pappas, uh, Robbie Santos, uh, Bobby Santos. I mean, we would roll over people just because the other attorneys didn't know what to do. And they hadn't studied up on it. They would come in and, you know, this is all we did. You know, day after day, you get good at it. And I just felt pretty bad representing the policyholder side on it. But on the other side, you know, I think insurance companies, they need attorneys to represent them. It wouldn't, if every single time all they did was to pay the policy limit and stuff like that, the product would go broke. Um, and, and, and there is a need, you know, for them. And having said that, that's the reason why, you know, I, I might give, <laughs> especially Evan up in, uh, Evan Stevenson up in the, with Wheeler Triggers, which is a great law firm, but Evan Steven, just because he argues everything on behalf of his client up there, a lot of grief and stuff like that. But the truth of the matter is the people at Zell, Claus and Miller, a lot of their truly colleagues and I, you got to respect for the fact they're on that side and there is an absolute need for good, competent. As a matter of fact, I'd rather go against good, competent, and smart and ethical, honest uh, insurance company counsel, um, you know, that are that are on the opposite side. And there's a there's a big need for them. And collegially as attorneys, you know, we get together. What was what was that old cartoon? You ever see that old cartoon where the where the sheepdog? You know, comes back and then the coyote's there too, and they start off in the morning going to work, and then they battle each other all day long. And at the end of the day, they, they go, they come back. You know, I personally, I, I just can't do that side, although I did do it, you know, for a period of time, and um, I'm very happy, and I think I'm a much better place doing it. But that doesn't mean other people represent insurance companies aren't that way. And I just wanted to throw that out because sometimes in our discussions, we have a tendency, I think, on the policyholder side, just to demonize the other side, which is not going to get you anywhere if you want to be very very good as a policyholder advocate or an appraiser especially for policy you better understand the insurance company side you're never going to be able to um, overcome why they might be wrong so i'd like to go to the next slide and it's the uh, windstorm insurance conference and we were this is from this year's uh, conference that was the i'm glad we got that in at the last time uh, but the Windstorm Insurance Conference, and I go to the next slide after that, which is slide 20. What is that, Larry? It's going to be slide 10. Slide 10. And this is going to be the Code of Ethics. Right, and I wrote about it because, and if you go to the to number 11, at the Windstorm Insurance Conference, and I was on the board of directors for, gosh, over a dozen years. And um, this is a picture of John Bopel. John was really instrumental. He, John Doan, um, Janet Brown, you know, pushed on this whole thing because, you know, with the advent of 
appraisal, as we talked about last week, become more and more important. They established at the beginning, you know, some of a a code of ethics for umpires, uh, 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 umpire mm -hmm. certification, you know, in 2003, them doing it. And if you go to the next thing after that, this yeah, is... But I just want to talk for a second about how important this code of ethics is. Um, well, that's the code, that's the IAUA one, Larry. Right. We aren't at that yet. Still the windstorm. So we're on the windstorm insurance conference, and so we're going to get to that. You got it. You know... You just these young guys, they just want to you go said on. You're trying to keep this down to 30 minutes. And I'm just trying to move along. So let's go to number 12, you know, on this. And the Windstorm Conference has these things written down as a as an ideal umpire. I mean, I just took it from what they think. And so, you know, when people start saying, What is an ideal umpire? you know, somebody's gonna timely impartial, you know, impartial due to the city. I'm timely is becoming a much bigger issue lately. I, I mean, some people used to say, Oh, this is gonna be a quick process. You go on for a year and a half, two years on some of these appraisals on these large ones. Is that timely? No. We could be over and done with in some trials by now. I mean, I know the, the federal court system is really trying to push for things to get done in in a 12-month period of time and at the longest, you know, a year and a half. But, you know, I, I don't know. And it can be very expensive to go through appraisal because you're paying all these other parties. You don't pay the judge. Our taxes pay the judge. Right. You know, and I remind everybody about that. Arbitration can even be more expensive. But... You know, with respect to it, timely is becoming an important part, and I think something you ought to ask, hey, do you really have time to devote to this? How long is it going to take for you to, how what, how many cases you got going on right now? And what, what's the general time frame that you might have on the cases you've got to get them done? I, you know, uh, justice delayed is justice denied, they say, and and at least it used to be appraised. If you read all the case law, the reason why it's in part approved by the courts is that is it a quick an efficient alternative to going to litigation, which sometimes I, you know, question. But, you know, so then they have the word is competent. Is the umpire competent? And we're going to get into that a little bit later because there's even some, uh, a whole law review, you know, to that. Observes high standards of conduct, which is important. I think integrity. We don't, that's a hard thing to classify because it's so subjective. But you look for people that are teachers, passionate to do this stuff, have a reputation in the field for being, um, fair and honest, and I don't mean just splitting the baby. I mean, being being fair and honest might be, you, your guys were just wrong. Well, and that's what a lot of the articles talk about, the difference between a mediator and an umpire. Right. A mediator is trying to come to a resolution that's a compromise. The importance of an umpire is actually making a decision. I mean, they actually are weighing out what's right based on the facts they have and the evidence. And they're supposed to make that decision. And splitting the baby or acting as a mediator is a big distinction that a lot of these articles talk about between a mediator and an umpire. And I think intelligent, you know, is, is important as well. You know, too, you better have that intelligence, especially to decipher some of the, I, I probably can't say, how do you say I, I'll just say BS that might go on mm -hmm. by some of these appraisals. What in the world are they saying on right. some of this stuff? Somebody can cut through and actually understand. And you got to be smart to be able to do that. It's got to be intelligent enough to have interpersonal skill sets to get through that. Somebody's going to command respect among the panel itself and everybody else. Guards the integrity and fairness of the appraisal process. That's in, you know that's something that I, you know I've got to commend John, uh, Vopel and them for first coming up with. A, you know thinking about the appraisal process as being something almost sacrosanct, and now organized as a process versus something that was when we first talked about it. In the early 1980s, mid 1980s, early 1990s was a rare, you know, thing to actually have this thing that hey, this process is going to go along. It better be treated as, you know, be, being the one that is is is, you know, imbued with fairness and integrity. I think is important. Um, talks about efficiency and people like that. The competence, you know, and it's trustworthy. I, I like that trustworthy. I always think of Boy Scouts. Were you ever a Boy Scout? Yes. For a little short period of time. Shazam. <laughs> Surprise about everything. There you go. There we go. So let's go to the next slide. Um, is, uh, we talked about last week, there's a, a couple of organizations that are really promoting uh, this, and uh, the IAUA is doing so, and they have a code of ethics. The slide after that shows the founder of the IAUA, although, you know, Rob Norton told me it was 30 people came together to help. Mm. They wanted to stop the gamesmanship they perceived. Uh, um, right, and a lot of these organizations are made up of independent adjusters um, that want to go out and train these additional appraisers. 
you know, the next slide, slide number 15, is finally the IAUA Code of Ethics. That there we, you go. I wanted to talk about. Why don't you talk about that, Larry? Yeah, I think this is important because um, whenever we're recommending an umpire to a judge, we want to show a third-party reference point uh, to support the credibility of the umpire that we're suggesting. And one of the problems when you don't have a third party that has a code of ethics is there is no rules in the policy most of the time as who can serve as an umpire. And this gives us confidence that people aren't going to put their livelihood on the line or their reputation on the line in making a decision for one party or the other. They're actually making the integrity right, of the process making that priority. And when you show a judge an IAUA code of ethics document or you show them the windstorm recommendations and explain that, Your Honor, this is someone who's a part of an organization that's made up of both insurance professionals and policyholder advocates, public adjusters, and different appraisers. Um, I think it helps the judge understand the process, and he'll definitely give stronger consideration to a candidate that has these you know, credentials and experience and training compared to someone that's just a IA that the insurance company wants to appoint or an engineer that the insurance company lists on their, on their request for an umpire. So I think it's important to know what these ethics are, I also think it's great when you're trying to get an umpire appointed if they're a member of both Windstorm, IAUA, or another organization. Now, if we can move along, because, you know, how to, you know, that's all great. These are the things you're looking for. But if you go to the slide 16, you know, these are some of the things that when you go through, um, I know Rob Norton's, you know, class and stuff like that. Slide 16 is great. So please yeah. pay attention to this slide. Write it, down these questions. Because, yeah, I think these questions are important to, to show, and this is what, uh, at least in his organization he's you know, started promulgating you know they how many times have you been an umpire is this your first time to go do it you know have you ever been an umpire you know with either appraiser or either party before you know what's your prior experience as an appraiser i, I often say and i've given speech i said my biggest concern about having an umpire is we we pick the poison pill so to speak there's something you know not disclosed about not that they know one side or the other as much as that they actually involved in another appraiser appraisal where the umpire is no longer the umpire the umpire is an appraiser or the umpire is a public adjuster or the umpire is an independent adjuster and you know it's just that concern that they might be trading um positions to help themselves out financially yeah. and that's the last thing you want to have and that's the last thing i guess i want to be thinking about that might be happening one way or another if i was an insurance company claims manager i'd be thinking the same thing you know, so, I, you know, it's, it, you know, so I say, if you put yourself just in that position, you don't want to have a, a umpires that are actively involved in other positions where they might be financially, oh, if I rule for you here, you're going to rule for me there, or at least the appearance of it. It just creates a lot of problems. And a lot of jurisdictions now, like I know in Colorado, DORA came out with a bulletin of a disclosure requirement. Yeah. And so that transparency is key. I mean, just because you're working with somebody else or you're at a convention with to. It doesn't mean you should be disqualified um, and your integrity should be challenged. It's just a matter of disclosing that information. A lot of times I see mistakes being made because people don't disclose that information up front. And in reality, um, you know, people, courts specifically will trust professionals to maintain their integrity and credibility. Um, and just having a contingency contract and a claim or working on another project for an insurance company doesn't always necessarily mean that you're incredulous. We're going to talk about some of those, so. you know, issues later. If we can talk about appraisal all day long. I can even talk about the section of the umpire all day long. Questions. We are trying to keep, uh, I guess, 30 minutes. We're 25 into it already. We're not even close. Oh, we get to get but, me in the But these now. questions that, that um, you know, the guys that are teachers and the instructors for the IAUA, you know, are, are you know, pretty important. So um, I, I will say that, uh, there has been a growing tendency if we go to page 17 of 21 and you might want to uh, print this out is is um yeah this is a great article and, and it's from the insurance i think that's an insurance i think that's a zell attorney who wrote this um as i recall you know the importance of the umpire subject matter expertise which is kind of interesting i i think it helps out quite a bit you could have an umpire though when i've i've often told larry i, I said you know a lot of times I've been in these things, and if we can't agree, I, I tell the judge who's making the selection, judge just pick somebody none of us know, but who's really smart. Yeah, you know? we want a fairness. You want a fairness, yeah. and sometimes the judge has done a lot of commercial litigation right. or construction, and a lot of times, guys, it's not just, you could have appraisal that's got all kinds of crazy valuations on commercial property of crazy nature, 
uh, the commercial property portion, business interruption, extra expense. Where are you going to find everybody who's a subject matter expert and all those things? I don't know if you possibly can. You know, but if you were to go and have a uh, valuation with respect to fine art, you might want to have an umpire that's in fine art. If it if it has something to do with the value of like a sailboat that sure. sank, maybe you want to have a person who's a good you know with sailing and understands values there. It's had some expertise in it in the past, you know. But there is a growing, at least a growing trend, I would say, somewhat of looking for umpires that have subject matter expertise and can cut through some of the bull that might go on from one side or another, or you know, in the bull maybe a bad word to cut through some of the issues that really aren't the issues the there. Posturing, right? So, you know, could, but on the other side, they could also then substitute themselves <clears throat> into as being like the ultimate arbitrator because they think they know more than what the other people are. And I think that's the problem on the other side too. I think another problem is what's the real reason why the carriers are pushing for a more of a specialty umpire? And it's because the insurance industry is what would fuel that itself. Right, because if you are a insurance industry that wants an umpire, you're going to have a relationship with more of these umpires that specialize in insurance or engineers, for example. Like I had one recently where they wanted a hey engineer, right, to serve as the umpire, and of course they they argued, well, your honor, that he has a specialty; he's able to identify these damages. They and wanted Hag, a hey a hey engineer yeah, to be yeah. an umpire, right? And so of course I'm arguing in front of the judge. I'm like, your honor. Absolutely. I hope you want. This, yeah, we want. But the, the purpose is, is that the umpire, so the, this article is great. It makes a lot of good points that you can pull up on from slide 17. But you have to understand the real motive behind it. The motive of having specialty umpires is they want to get it away from people like judges, retired judges, that have a sophistication about fairness of a process. And they want to be able to, I hate to say this, but oftentimes it results, whether it's intentional or unintentional, into one of their guys that they work with on other claims. And therefore, it leads to an impartial process. And I think that's why it's important to understand what the motives are behind their arguments so you can really present to the court what's really going on that could be a potential conflict. So if you see the specialty argument, we like to put fairness over that specialty argument because in reality, these umpires, if it's Hague Engineering makes more money from the insurance industry from any other source. Yeah, I mean, country. because you might as well say they're not going to pay attention to what one right. person says or another. They're going to they're put down what they think right. versus listening to what both you know, the differences are and then coming based upon what the evidence is, you know, from what they're saying doesn't mean that that umpire also has to be a dummy about it. They they can do it, but that's the, that's the risk you run if you have an umpire that thinks yeah. they're smarter than, than anybody else on something, which I guess you don't have any problem with that, right? No, you no. never think that. Never. Cognitive bias. We all think we're, we're right on what we think. Hey, I wanted to go to somebody that really is a subject matter expert, though, on uh, so what are we up to 18 out of 31? Yes, sir. With Jonathan Wilkowski. Yep. Um, Jonathan's a, a great colleague, and he, I'm giving a plug for his book that he's got over there on the right. Again, we talked about him uh, last week, and, and, and uh, you know, Jonathan's up there in New York. And Jonathan, if you're listening in, we, the whole country's watching New York <clears throat> right now, and how are you doing? I, I'm sorry. I know you've lost some very close friends, and um, we hope you all are coming back on it. And uh, But... You know, for everybody's out there and wants to study and have a reference, you know, book on it, you know, that, that book on appraisal in the third edition that Jonathan's got is, is just fantastic. He has um, a lot of discussion about the selection of an umpire and the various criteria that might go on it. And I uh, just wanted to give a plug out and a shout out to Jonathan on that as we continue on for, for today's discussion. If you go to, to slide 19 of 21, and this is something I posted, you know, can an umpire really... You know, can can a neutral umpire really be selected? And yeah, I and I yeah. often because we all have some biases. I don't know if you can get rid of you know no, complete you biases at all. Yeah. I, you know, but the blog does a good job of, of referencing a defense firm's article. Again, it's the Zell Law Firm, and you cite to the article which you guys can download. And we're going to repost the PowerPoint presentation now. It's on slide 19. If you follow the blog, this will be cited. But really, this this raises this is not just Chip's concern. You know, this is a, a title of a blog that's coming from an article about the inherent bias of the one that's being hired by the party. Can an appraiser really be impartial? Can an umpire really be impartial? And it really breaks down to a few different issues that really concerns insurance companies, which is surprising to me because they're the ones that include these appraisal provisions. But it's almost a, um, I don't want to say an article of despair, but they're given a, a, a grim light on appraisal, which I've seen them use to their benefit for years and years. 
And essentially, the main concerns of this article is that, number one, appraisal is getting broader, okay? It's getting broader. And causation is now being included in more and more appraisals, which concerns insurance companies because they want to narrow the appraisal process. Uh, number two, they talk about, you know, even if you know, the appraisers and umpires are getting less and less impartial, because now more policyholders are invoking appraisal than ever before, right? It's usually, like we talked about last week. So they only want it geared toward them, the umpires right. they know, because right. that's the way it used to always be. The independent appraiser talks to the appraiser who's picked out of the yellow pages, yeah. and all of a sudden they're picking a friendly independent uh, adjuster yeah. as the who can only represent insurance companies as the friendly neutral umpire. Well, those days are gone. And now, but, of course, there's more policyholder advocates that understand this process that can actually present the appraisal panel with a, um, you know, potential award. And it's amazing to me that the insurance companies never want a third-party opinion that's unbiased, whether it's a jury verdict or appraisal award. And finally, this article talks about, and this is important, this is a non-judicial dispute resolution process, and there's no rules of conduct or evidence. And well, again, that's something that they can write into the policy. They can write certain things. Well, I want to talk about they can write it into policy. So let's go to slide number um, 20. Is it 20? Yes. So this is the standard, you know, provisions in almost the standard fire insurance policy, but it's the one adopted. And if you go back to a lot of the older case law, you talk about um, where the courts, and this, when they first were coming out with standard policies that the legislatures promulgate. You've got to have an insurance policy that says this, and it's got this provision for appraisal. And as you read through it, you know, I was asking, Larry, guess, guess who can, guess who's supposed to select the umpire? And Larry first guesses, ah, like most people, well, the parties select them. Right. No, it says the appraisers select the umpire. And you almost get into, well, really, do the parties really have any say in this whatsoever, what are they supposed to do with respect to the appraisal? And if you go back to the old cases, they actually talk about a process being appraisal, they're determined through the arbitration process. And really a lot of times, and there was an old, in the 1916 Rough Notes book uh, by Hall, he talks about, he assumed what the courts were talking about was they refer to appraisal rather than arbitration be because arbitration would, would allow for both the determination of the damages as well as the liability, the causation. He said, whereas historically, the appraisal was just supposed to be with respect to the amount of damages. I would definitely say the modern trend has gotten away from that and that, you know, for some reason, people have forgotten some of these issues about, can you really have a process that has no rules, you know, that's going to go ahead and determine this because appraisal itself doesn't versus what courts might think you got to follow some type of arbitration process with the providing of evidence and things like that or maybe not you know because there's some court cases going older ones going back and forth saying only if it's a total loss do you actually have a right to present evidence and have it more formal that way because everything's missing and you need to have evidence and if it's partial the the, the panel themselves can go do it calling it common law arbitration which is kind of bizarre. You wouldn't even talk about these things a hundred years later, but that was the debate of the day. But still, we were talking before we started, like in Nebraska. Right. The phrase is unconstitutional. So right. It, it, the provisions don't read like the one on slide 20. It reads that both parties have to agree to participate, and then it's not binding on either party. So it's basically voluntary and non-binding, which is a waste of time. So if you go to the next, so just remember that this, I know you were saying that the insurance policies say this, they write it in there, but in a lot of states, it was historically written, you, almost all the states, you got to have this standard policy as a minimum policy. Some of the states got rid of it with the easy read policies that came out in the early 1970s and the statutes were changed. But if you go through um, to the next slide, we got a big picture of one of the best attorneys in our law firm out of Chicago, Ed Eshoo. Ed is a master, a master at the standard fire insurance policy. They have that up in Illinois. And if you go to, to slide 22 uh, two. Two, that you want to go print out, can a court select an umpire for appraisal without notice to one of the parties? Because when you read that previous position, it says it doesn't say you have to file a lawsuit. It says you just got to get a court within the jurisdiction to go do it or a judge, you know, to go do it. And so I've been at seminars. I can still remember I rolled out of my chair um, at the Gapia seminar maybe two or three years ago where some attorneys go, yeah. Just send a letter down there to the judge. 
and go get somebody appointed that way. You know, and the crazy thing about it, you know, is I, now Ed says you can't do that, obviously. Well, in Illinois. So in Illinois. The case is, is, is but, Witcher versus State Farm. In that case, the policyholders, uh, appraiser, raised the, no, they went to the courthouse, they provided a list, and the same day, before it could even be served, the judge appointed an umpire. And then it went to an award, and then he got appealed. He eventually overturned it, determined that if you invoke a judicial process, you have to serve the summons with the petition. But if you go and you print out this other blog that I wrote in 2015, appointing an umpire for an appraisal, do you have to file a lawsuit, and you get to a different, you know, a different result depending upon where you're at. You know, so if you go to this next one, um, and I cite in there a law review article, Texas courts like jurisdiction to even hear the motions to appoint an umpire. If you were to read some of that stuff, yeah, I've done it right and left. When say, hey, judge, I need somebody appointed. Uh, after Hurricane Ike, we would go right down. They had a whole procedure in the Houston courthouse. You just, hey, we want to have an appraisal. Boom, they would give you one. It was an ancillary proceeding. They had something already set up. Uh, if you go to Coffee with Tom, this well, is part slide 25. 20, so that was 25. Now go to yeah, 25, asking a judge to appoint an umpire, informal process, a guide to appraisal. It's a great thing to read, you know, for Texas, but it also goes through a discussion about, you know, hey, the laws are different, the jur different jurisdictions about the selection and how you go about selecting an umpire if you disagree uh, about one. And if the, I guess, you know, the, it's, Again, I say the parties do, but it's really it's supposed to be the appraisers if you were to read it. But the only reason the appraisers can get to the right one is if they even ask the parties if you read, you know, what both I think John Bopel has been teaching through the Windstorm Conference as well as um, the IUA. Um, and I thought that, uh, well, we talked about some of the expertise and stuff that's going to be argued. So that was, I got, I don't know why that, Megan, I got one out of sync. Number 26 should have been further up, and we talked about that. Um, uh, this is a great uh, article that uh, Matthew Pearson, I saw. So slide 27. 27. Larry keeps me on track here. Matt Pearson's a great attorney out this of is a uh, very large article. Texas. is a great law review article. I asked Matt for it way back when. Um, we just give a shout out. I think it's really fantastic to read, you know, but if you go to slide 28, you know, they talk about, hey, the contract doesn't say you have to file a lawsuit. And then they, they cite a court case for the proposition of the court. The contract doesn't make it a requirement, but the law does, you know, which is just kind of interesting on the selection because you know, how you and how you do that. The the last thing that we've got here. And we can Hold on, just, just break that down a little bit. Now, sure. Essentially, the contract doesn't say a lawsuit has to be filed, but there's case law in Texas that says it does. Well, it's both ways. Then you have Texas law, case law that says a court can't even hear it. And then you have case law in you know, in Illinois, it says it's got to go that way, but I can show you other jurisdictions that say it doesn't. I think the smarter and the more prevalent rule, and since I was guilty of it a long time ago when I was a younger attorney, but is that if you're going to go and do something that is at, you know, possibly adversarial, I think, just to be honest, you owe due process considerations that's guaranteed to everybody. I mean, they're you got to have some rules and you've got to give fair notice to the other side to show up for the appointment of um of course. A, a a umpire if you imagine and, and that's been my umpire. and that's been my well i used to always argue larry that will judge they wrote the policy it doesn't say i had to go do it i'm just following what the policy says and and there'll be some judges in some counties that i go all the way through boy they'd appoint that umpire off we go they would usually appoint somebody that's friends with the ump with the you know, a retired judge or something like that. And we still see that. As a matter of fact, I will literally argue in front of a judge. Judge, don't appoint anybody they've asked for. Right. And as a matter of fact, if you were to appoint somebody, I, I think you could. I think mine are a lot more fair than they do. But of course, I think they're more fair than, than, than the other yeah, guys at the other good. side. But I would suggest maybe somebody that nobody knows who's really, you know, somebody you would trust, you know, to, to you know, give a fair opinion back and forth. But, but nobody can know them. If, Found a number of judges to follow that, just trying to get a, an ideal, you know, uh, smart person from Timbuktu that'll come in and help the parties through this uh, resolution. You know, the the, the last uh, article I think was real good from the Zell firm. Again, not trying to, and it's got Steve Badger's name on it. I bet you Kristen Cummings wrote most of this, and not Steve Badger, but I thought it was the uh, a, a pretty good article that if you want to see some of the you know, what the insurance companies are arguing about in terms of the, 
devolution of appraisal and insurance disputes. I don't. I think I think, it, I think it's only devolved because the insurance companies now have uh, a a fair battle going on, on on the other side versus before. It used to be historically, as we talked about last week. And if you didn't get a chance to see our stuff last week, please go back and take a look at it because this process used to be so rigged for you know insurance companies when we first started, and I think that's changed a lot. Uh, I know some people like. Um, would say, geez, Chip, or question whether or not Steve Patrick's teaching of people how to be more advocates for their position and for their point of view regarding um, um, a, a loss and, and how to explain things in a way that makes sense to a judge or to a judge they don't particularly like. Yet, you know, the insurance companies have some really, really good um, appraisers on their side that, you know, I just roll my eyes when they get appointed on a large case because they just seem to be so tough and I don't know if they're really paying attention to one of those first slides I showed you up or the one that said hey we all supposed to be here for the possible to make certain they're getting what they're owed you know I'm not talking about a windfall I'm talking about what they're owed there seems to be a lot of people that take uh, great delight in just trying to keep that down um, and at the same time it's not right just hey you know I look how much I got almost like they got a windfall that's not windfalls are not right and I think, you know, for, for everybody who criticizes Steve Patrick, I think that's wrong. Steve will absolutely stand up. You want to have honest, fair, reputable, and, and a, an award with an integrity, you know, when it comes through. And that's all he's ever preached um, for that. And I, I commend him for that. But uh, well, a lot of people take things out of context. You've experienced that. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you read this article, and I, and we all know, I don't, I'm not accusing anybody of being ethical, but if you take this last line here, if you open this article up, it says, unfortunately, there's no good answer for the party faced with such conduct other than fight back, right? Like that's the, you know, that's, this is, we all know what this means in reality when you take this in context of the article. They're saying that there's flaws in this process and you have to fight that flaw in those processes. This doesn't mean that we're just going to fight unethically every award out there. They'll take what Steve Patrick says or something else that someone else says out of context, at least a very poor result. So I think it's important going back to why it's important to have this umpire is that they are challenging these awards. And so if you're, for the people out there that, you know, are trying to not disclose certain things or for both sides, the insurance company and for the policyholder, we're going to find out. We're going to find out if the insurance company has an improper relationship with an umpire and vice yeah. versa. Yeah. And at the end of the day, what good is an award if it's going to be set aside in appeal or fought? Yeah, and, and, I've taken, an and I've taken the position just because it's almost like Pollyanna that we're almost wishing that appraisers are going to be you know, predisposed one way or another, and, I've, and, I've, and there's a whole view out there saying just expect the appraiser to be um, more concerned with the outcome by the party that's hiring them and paying them, um, that, and, and that means the importance of selecting a truly um, competent, whatever that might mean, uh, uh, disinterested, and somebody's going to give a fair decision back as an umpire and can control you know, these two other individuals so that a, a good award um, that's fair and honest and, you know, that I don't know if the word necessarily nobody likes because honestly, if, if, if the, uh, if, if you rule 98% in favor of one person and that one person thinks he's all right, he's still out 2%, but, you know, it, if that's the way the evidence is, that's the way it ought to go one way or another. I just let them go how they come out. Now, you know, the one thing about these things, we said we were going to go for 15 minutes and now I have questions. And we now we've gone for 45 minutes, but now we actually have time for questions, Megan. So I don't have my reading glasses on, but maybe we have some questions that, that Larry and I can try to have so we can have a real true discussion with our, our viewers here. Yeah, so I think one of the questions that, that I thought was interesting, um, and, you know, I think it's going to depend on the jurisdiction. A lot of these depend on the jurisdiction. But the question from Frank James is, can the cost of the appraisal and or PA fee be counted towards the deductible? And I think that the issue, I think the answer generally, and I want to hear what your opinion is, Chip, I think the answer is no. Because no. the policy does not provide coverage for public appraisal well, fees. So, appraisal well, first of all, just read. So read what the policy covers, okay? Just read, read what it covers and read what the definition of the deductible is you know, might be. If you're talking about the cost of the appraiser, that answer is going to be no, because if you read almost every single clause I can think of, the cost of the, the cost. each has got to pay the appraiser and split the cost of the umpire, 
No, that has nothing to do with the amount of the loss um, versus now you get some questions and boy, that's a, that's a heck of a question. Suppose the, suppose the policy provides for the payment of claims expenses and it defines claims expenses to determine what the amount of loss is. And let's just pretend because now they don't, they used to at one time, they'll pay for a public adjuster's expense. Right. So like a show policy back in the day. Back in the day. There are a number of policies might pay for it. Now the only licensed individuals who can get, you know, paper they exclude for getting payment for, but anyway. And suppose those expenses are super, super high to determine the amount of the claim. Would the amount above the limitation with respect to claims expenses go uh, to help offset the amount owed under the deductible? Read the policy, but it just might. And and, and so again, read the full policy, RTFP, and I always tell everybody that RTFP, read the, read the, read the policy would be the first thing Frank you ought to do, but it's a it's a good question. So yeah. let's see if somebody else can stump me. Yeah, I got one. It's, it's unique to uh, a code in California. And of course, you know, we're experts in California, right? Well, I got a California law office. license. So, there you go. I, I passed that bar examination out there. Well, good. A, and I got a question for you from Mark Murphy. Okay, Mark it Murphy. It appears in California, it appears that while appraisals are an option following a disaster, the insurance company is not compelled to agree to an appraisal. It says appraisal in the event of a government declared disaster as defined in the government code, appraisal may be requested by either the insured or the insurance company, but shall not be compelled. And referring to California Insurance Code Section 2071. No, you know what? You might have stumped me on that one because I, I don't I don't remember that. I think the bigger thing in, in California regarding the appraisals that are out there is that uh, Amy Bach of United Policy Holders had a big a rewrite of the way appraisal ought to take place. And if you actually read the, the California Insurance Code, it's it's a pretty formal process with respect to appraisal, something that attorneys would be much more used to doing. And so typically what happens in California, and, and it should be done this way, is that the parties, if you're going to do what I would call a non-statutory appraisal, is make sure you put that in writing and that you both agree to what the process is going to be. Uh, because I see a lot of appraisals out there that go on that get brought to us after the fact and it don't follow the statute whatsoever in, in California. But uh, I, who, who wrote that? Frank J James? Who, who was that? Murphy? It was Mark Murphy. Mark, 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 you stumped me. I forget so, that particular uh, statute in California. So um, I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask uh, uh, Derek, uh, Victor, and Dan out there, our California full-time based attorneys about that. Maybe they can write a blog about that just to help out on that that, that uh, answer. Okay, um, I have a good one that I'm gonna address um, from Michael Paul. Is there a problem with a contractor paying for the appraisal costs with an AOB or an AOC, which is an assignment of insurance claim? Well, they own it. Hear me out. Yeah, but here's, but here's the catch. No, there's no problem with you paying for the appraiser because you're stepping in the shoes, right? Especially in Florida because of all the obligations you have based on the new laws from last July. But here's the catch. Appraiser fees are not covered under the contract. So when you submit your replacement cost invoices for what you're doing the work for to the insurance company, you, for example, if it's a $1 million claim and you're paying a $10,000 appraiser fee, if you do not bill that insured insurance company the $1 million and pay that appraiser fee separate from the claim as an expense unrelated to that claim payment, okay, for invoicing purposes, you're allowed to pay it. So how do you do it? You build the job just like you would any other job. You submit the RCV benefits, but in your operating account, you have ex uh, appraisal expenses related to the Smith claim. And that's not related and it's distinct and separate from the actual overhead and profit of that job. You cannot build that expense into that job and then claim it as a benefit under the RCV provision. Does that make sense? I hope he says yes. And just remember, uh, you don't have assignment of benefits in Texas unless there's already litigation. And in Florida, we've had a big change to the AOB statute. So if people have not gone to uh, contractors in both Texas and in Florida, have not gone and spoken to Texas licensed attorneys to get advice or Florida licensed construction attorneys, on, on their uh, assignment of benefits contracts, you absolutely need to. Okay. Um, Julie Harmon has a good question for you, Chip. What if you find out that an umpire and an appraiser have done several appraisals together and have ruled favorably for one another, 
after you have verbally agreed to the proposed umpire. Wait, two appraisers have had? The appraiser and the umpire. So the, the appraiser recommends an umpire, right, to the policy holder's umpire, yeah, appraiser. And then the appraiser finds out later, or some party finds out, that there's actually prior claims that the appraiser and the umpire work together on. Well, that, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, it can mean something. That's why you ought to ask the questions up front. There you go. You know, and I think it's go asking this. Go back to the slide. Go back to the sliding. I mean, that, that's, that's the whole thing. Just ask the questions up front. And it might not matter. They might have done all kinds of work together, you know. And the next thing you know, they find out they hate each other now. You know, it's... <laughs> There's all just because people have worked together in the past doesn't mean they like each other right now. I point that out, you know, quite a bit. So it's like, hey, how are they getting along today? I mean, a lot of, you know, right now, two months ago, a whole bunch of people were loving their spouse. Right now, I find all that loving and going so good. My divorce colleagues can tell you their business is booming right now. Right. So just because you've had, you know, prior instances of people working together, you know, sometimes the more you work together, some people next thing you know, and it's just so common for humans. You know that that good relationship is no longer a good relationship; it's a bad relationship. So, you know, just the incidents of working back and forth together is, you know, look, I, I, there's panels that have been going on, two appraisers against each other and the umpire over and over and over, and actually sometimes I find the umpire that's got good integrity, afterwards just, you know, pounds one or the other, you know, to to either get going or get off their horse and stuff like that. They understand the gamesmanship that might go on from one to another. You know, I, I, and and some, uh, you know, uh, it's just really hard to do. I I, I know it's so that that's a that's a very difficult question, but it ought they it's a very difficult question to answer because it depends upon really what happened. And I'm more concerned again about the ongoing relationship about an umpire being an appraiser on another case where they might get. A, they have a 10% interest on a case that might be worth $10 million. And all of a sudden, I'm worried, geez, these two guys are in this position here. Would they trade it out? I would hope that would never happen. But, you know, if I was my client and it's in their shoes, I'd be concerned about it. You would want to raise that issue up, you know, up front. So, yeah, so ask the questions before you ever agree to an umpire. There's a great list of questions that was around slide 14 to 16. Just make that into a letterhead, send it off, and make sure you find out what that relationship is. If they disclose it and you don't like it, don't agree to them. If they disclose it and you do like it, then at least you know what's going on. Yeah, I've given some speeches. As a matter of fact, in Texas, if you go through the condominium code, you actually have they have some regulations regarding this about who can be an appraiser and who can be an umpire. You know, of all places, Texas has got this code for a state that doesn't believe that you can do anything you want to. They have some regulations on that. No license, no problem. So, um... <laughs> So, Gary Gillette has a question. He says, um, all, That's probably Gillette. Gillette. Um, all, all, I'm going to go with all state. Uh, <laughs> he uses a little verb there, or uh, uh, interesting term for all state. It's currently denying the They call him all snake. Yeah, he did. It's you can't do that. Don't demonize him that way. Right. So, um, it's currently denying to pay awards after appraisals. How to handle? Well, Gary, what jurisdiction are you in? Because, in, um, first of all, in any jurisdiction, an insurance company that has a binding award. So if you're in a jurisdiction that says that the award is binding, it is a hell of a risk for an insurance company not to pay an award. This is why insurance companies fight so hard on the front end by declarations of appraisal, memorandums of appraisal, filing deck actions on coverage issues, fighting over causation in the appraisal. Except in Colorado. No, Colorado. They... <laughs> now, now the trend is right now, if you're a couple of insurance companies, I would say their trend is to allow their attorneys to argue anything they possibly can to get out of paying an award that they think is favorable to their own customer. So, yep. you know, so, so you know, and, and, and it's almost everything to win and nothing to lose in Colorado for doing that, right. except for the fact that there is some delay statutes out there with respect to paying it. Um, but, you know, so that, that goes back to the point. If they're not paying the award, then have your client consult with an attorney. The attorney can sue for yeah. breach of contract, the and, amount of loss. And, and, and in some, some jurisdictions, if they pay that award right away, it almost absolves them from all of their, it's like going to confession as a Catholic kid. You know, I'd go to confession all the right. time for all the stuff I was doing because phew, I'd go in, come out. I'm free from all. I might have beat the hell out of these kids. I might have sinned and all this kind of stuff, but I'm free after confession. Mm -hmm. You pay that appraisal award, it's like going to Catholic confession. You're absolved of everything you've done wrong, and there could be no bad faith action. I have no idea. I understand the religious aspect of the Catholic stuff, but I don't know why in our real stuff we're supposed to be, you know, 
holding insurance companies accountable for treating people in good faith, to get why all of a sudden free. they're involved? It's a, it's a crazy right. card. So, so Gary, I asked you what jurisdiction you're in because in Texas, the insurance side will, carriers will argue that if they pay the appraisal award timely to get a jail free card. If you're in a jurisdiction that that's not the case, there's a lot of bad faith potential exposure there. There's obviously a breach of contract exposure there, so that's how you handle that. Another quick question, and then we get into Mr. Norton's question after Stephanie Lee out of Oklahoma. Uh, my Stephanie, Stephanie Lee's got a question. She's got a question, and it's not a question we can really answer. It's oh, not. I can answer Stephanie's questions all day long. Here we go. See if Steve can, she, sure. Stephanie Lee can. Oh, she's got you stumped here. Uh oh. Yep. How long should the appraisal process take? Fast. It's supposed to be fast. So what is it supposed to be? Not. What's supposed to be done fast? You call up the appraiser. How come it can't go faster? You yeah. call the other side up, hey, can we make this thing go faster? Can we both call the umpire and ask why it can't go faster? There's all kinds of things you could do. I've We filed lawsuits to ask the judge to force the umpire to make it go faster. You know, I've, I've complained to the Department of Financial Services about it not going fast enough. There is, oh my God, and I won't say his name out there, but I've been... <laughs> <laughs> There's people I've yelled at right and left. Will you please get going on this case faster? It drives me nuts yeah. that people aren't out trying to take it. You shouldn't have taken the job to begin with as an umpire and an appraiser unless you're going to get it done with for the policyholder. I represent policyholders. They want their money right away. They want everything paid and they want it paid right away. So would you if you use the golden rule. If you're an insurance company, ooh, maybe we don't want to pay it so fast. We just hold that money. On the other hand, I'm certain there's a lot of claims managers going, Close why is it taking so long to get this file? Do, are those appraisers and umpires just driving up their yeah, feet? I, I mean, yeah, the honestly, and stuff it. like that. And they're just getting, geez. Well, they're getting chewed out by the they're getting, Well, they're they getting chewed out for the expenses and right. stuff like that. So I answered her question. Yeah, that's pretty good. Fast. Pretty good. Yeah. So here's a really good question. We're going to end on this question from uh, Bob Norton, because um, I think this could take some time to answer, and then we'll finish up. Bob, Bob's a smart guy. If an appraiser or both of them, introduce a very significant element of damage that was not in the pre-appraisal claim handling, what is your recommendation for the panel? So they go out there, you've got a dispute over the amount of loss, and then... The same, the same way, the same way if they find something that shouldn't have been out there. I I think this got posed um, when I was in, in Colorado, and I, I think Steve Badger was up there, if I'm not mistaken, debating against me, and I... If somebody asked me, like, well, why does they find out that the uh, damage was really caused by another storm? I said, don't pay it. Even if the insurance company has agreed to pay it, yeah. Why? You're supposed to come up with an honest award, you know, and you, there's nothing that says what they've done before is binding. I well, understand it's supposed to take your, hold on. take the differences, take but the, the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, what are you supposed to do? Say, oh, I'm going to pretend as if this information I just got doesn't exist. Oh. And that's the thing. No. And so he asked me, what are you supposed to do? Hey, guys, y'all missed this. We, the two appraisers, we found this and and we agree on it. Boom. All right. So, Especially if they say they agree on it. And right. it might be higher, sure. but it also, I think, can be lower, which a lot of people get afraid. And that's what I might tell people. Hey, guys, you go to appraisal. And this is what a lot of good old public adjusters in the old days used to say. Why would you let third parties go take a look at something? They could screw it up all day long and come up with a smaller amount, you know, so. You can't have your cake and eat it too. So if you're going to include causation to appraisal, right, Bob? Well, it opens the door. It opens the door to determining it, what's covered and what's not covered. However, I don't think the appraisal process is designed to take money back out of the claims process. So I think when you evaluate what the policy provision is, it says dispute what's under dispute. So what I would recommend, Bob, because I've been in that situation, and I don't think the appraisers often agree to include that in the award, I think the appraisers should notify the parties of this additional pitch, and that should be adjusted immediately by the parties so that they can either include that in the appraisal process moving forward, or if there's a coverage dispute over that element, then it's not included in the appraisal process. But that being said, we are at... And that being said, it's 3 o'clock. And uh, this has been a great discussion. Thank you very much for all the questions. And uh, next week, we're going to be with some of these other questions we've had at appraisal because it's such a big and important topic. And thank you all very much for being viewers again. And Larry, thank you so much for being able to show up here today with me. Yes, thank you for having me again.